Hey everybody, welcome to the Curtis Vlog. So for most of this week, I honestly thought I was going to be talking about President Trump's rescinding of DACA, right? How it's going to affect the Dreamers, how it's going to be implemented, and how it relates to the balance of power as discussed in the previous video on executive orders. And then came Irma. Irma, for those of you who managed to avoid all the disaster porn over the internet, is a powerful hurricane barreling towards the state of Florida. It was at one point considered to be the strongest storm on record reproducing the Atlantic Basin. As to what Irma has to do with why I'm not talking about DACA today, well, I live here and Irma is expected to be about here by the time this video releases on Monday, so with all the preparations, frankly I didn't have time to do all the research I needed to do for the DACA video to give it justice. This isn't my first rodeo, you know, I lived through the 2004 hurricane season and most of the storms that have been back to Florida since, so I know the kind of damages and perils that they can bring and how to prepare for that. But the thing with Irma is that its strength predictions were very volatile. We didn't know if this was going to hit Gainesville at a Category 4 or at a Category 2, and if it was Category 4 we were going to get the f*** out of Dodge, but fortunately it looks like it's going to end up hitting us at about a Category or two strength or even lower, so for now at least we've decided to stay put. And actually that's not a terrible segue to what I want to talk about today. Those numbers, one, two, and four, they give a really interesting lesson in science and measurement because they actually came about more from political expediency than as opposed to some extant scientific law. Those categories represent three of the possible five levels on the Sapphire Simpson scale. The scale runs from about one, which is the weakest, to five, which is the strongest, although the National Hurricane Center warns people that a category one hurricane is still considered to be very dangerous. The Saffir relates to civil engineer Herbert Saffir who came up with the idea of the scale. He was on commission for the UN to investigate housing in hurricane prone areas. In the process he realized that there was no easy way of communicating a storm's strength. He was inspired by the utility of the Richter scale, the measurement they used for earthquakes, so he created a 1 to 5 scale based upon wind speeds to signal to people when a storm was more likely to be catastrophic than otherwise. The Simpson refers to the contemporaneous director of the National Hurricane Center, Robert Simpson. Together they added measures of air pressure and storm surge expectancies to account more fully for the total damages caused by these storms, because hurricanes aren't all about wind. When Matthew put this in Augustine area last year, it wasn't the wind that caused the most damage, it was the flooding caused by the storm surge. But to call this measurement imperfect would be a bit of an understatement. Wind speed, storm surge, and barometric pressure are correlated parts of a hurricane, but they're also different enough that it really doesn't make a lot of sense to put them all into the same five-factor model. For instance, when it comes to storm surge, you can have one that's higher than expected given the strength of the storm, or lower than expected given the strength of the storm, all based upon the location of where the hurricane makes landfall. So they decided to mix the surge and pressure stuff in 2009 and make it a simple wind scale. They do now have something for storm surge by itself, which they've named, and I kid you not, the SLOSH model, because who doesn't love a good acronym pun? In 2012, they opted to change the definition of what constituted a Category 4 storm by changing the boundaries by one mile per hour in both directions. So, you know, one mile per hour slower is now a storm, one mile per hour faster is now a storm. And this really wasn't taken as so much of a big deal, but it does show that the definitions aren't necessarily scientific, they're more at the discretion of the bureaucrats and the experts running the National Hurricane Center. And after Irma was labeled the most powerful storm to ever come out of the Atlantic Basin, there were calls to make a new level to the scale and call it a Category 6. Similar calls were made after Hurricane Katrina as well, because they felt that having it capped at five wouldn't necessarily capture the destruction and power that these storms could possibly go to. The journey of this scale shows that just attaching numbers to some categories doesn't necessarily make it a perfect scientific measure. But it also shows us how willing we are to perceive these scientific qualities and extend the legitimacy of a measure far beyond its intended usage. Sanford designed the scale not for scientific validity, but to easily allow lay people to understand the severity of a storm barreling their way. There's no reason to put a category six above a category five because the category five is already intended to mean something that is catastrophic or even worse. In Category 3s are considered to be major storms. In scientific parlance, we call these ordinal measures, and then, you know, there's a specific order from most to greatest, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense to talk in, like, a Category 3.5 score. There's no specific, you know, tuning that one can be made between them. Don't get me wrong, they're useful, and they're often used by survey researchers all the time, but they simply cannot get the degree of precision that, say, a thermometer can for temperature. However, the aims, design, and intent of the scale really isn't befitting such precision. At its core, the idea of the scale was to be an approximation of the severity of the storm and kind of give people an idea of what kind of contingencies they should start making in the you know preparation for its coming. Unless you've lived through a large major storm, it's going to be difficult to understand the kind of damages that can come in from a millibar measure or from a wind speed measure. And so for this, having these simple categories is really just an easy way to convey information across to people. We have to recognize that many such things are made out of convenience, not necessarily out of scientific veracity. 
right? So in the case of this scale, it was made out of political expedience. But there are a number of other things that are given numbers to kind of give this air of certainty that really are just used as kind of a means of just conveying rough approximations. All right, I'd like to close out this video with a call to action. So I uploaded this video on Saturday with a scheduled release, knowing full well that my internet come Sunday and Monday is going to be a bit spotty, if not, you know, just power in general. All the best estimates show that we're going to be getting some strong winds, but nothing that's going to cause any sort of structural threats. So there's a 99.9% .9 chance that, you know, us personally, Stephanie and I, we're going to be fine. But this storm will have just devastated the entire South Florida region, and depending on where it hits, it could have upended millions of lives and caused hundreds of millions of dollars in property damages, right? The human and economic toll of this storm is going to be immense, and it is contingent upon us to be to donate, to do whatever we can to try to alleviate the suffering that's been caused by it. I'd like to remind everyone that just because a disaster just happened, it doesn't negate the suffering of those victims from disasters that have just happened or are currently happening now. Before it came here, Irma bulldozed through the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, right? California is on fire. There is flooding going on in India right now, and obviously there is still the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey to deal with. Anything that we can give, really anything that we can do to help alleviate the human suffering caused by these disasters would really go a long way. I've put a link down in the description for places that you can donate to. Speaking as a graduate student, I know that not everybody has a lot that they can afford to give, and I'm not asking you as an individual to go out there and save the world, but if we can give just a little bit, that makes the world that much a bit of a better place. We are making the world a better place through our small, accumulating actions, and really, there's not much else you can ask for in this life. Thanks to all the new subscribers who opted to join after watching the textbook video. We're happy to have you. Welcome. Uh, we'll be addressing comments for that video as well as this one uh, next week. Uh, the week after that, we'll not be having a video unless it's kind of a short, maybe silly sort of thing because I actually have my PhD qualifying exams happening that week. So, actually, it was supposed to happen this Monday, but, you know, hurricane. Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. I look forward to reading all of them and answering a few of them uh, in the next comment response video uh, next week. Links for everything is always be down in the doobly doo, as well as links to the Facebook, the Twitter, and the blog. I look forward to seeing you guys out there as well. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so by commenting down below, by sharing this video, and by subscribing to stay in the loop for more awesome social science content is uploaded. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you next time.